Hey everybody, Leanna here. This is Tata's Tuesday. And yes, I have delved into the Wham! report on Twitter harassment. Wham! is of course Women Action Media, the organization that everybody felt was not going to give Gamergate a fair shake when it got involved. Well, surprise, surprise. Uh, the findings were intriguing. Now, before we get into this stuff, I want to make a few things clear. First of all, um, this this report was quite small, as as they say themselves. Uh, the two the two big caveats they put in was the sample size was fairly small. We'll see that, and they had trouble collecting data because the media got the reporting of the story wrong with. Uh, Wham's involvement with Twitter and Twitter harassment. They talk about in the report the fact that they had some issues with the fact that the media referred to their authorized reporter status as a partnership with Twitter. It wasn't anything of the sort. That's in the summary of findings. I strongly recommend you do not just stop, start at the start and stop at the summary of findings. Uh, it, it doesn't give enough detail because it's just a summary. Now, the, I'm, I'm scrolling through here because um, I don't find the qua quantitative analysis all that compelling. What I do find is the qualitative elements of this report extremely useful as a first step. Um, what I find interesting is the things that Wham has identified as harassment. This is important because everybody has a different idea of what harassment is. And I think it's extremely good for someone to at least attempt to go, this is what we consider harassment, this is what we don't consider harassment. And what I find interesting is a lot of things in this report are things that I agree are a form of harassment. Other people think, no, no, it's not harassment. Things like libel, false quotes attributed to you, altered images, um, things like, um, we'll, we'll get to it later on, but I think this is, incredibly important because I think that in terms of, of Twitter, what's more important, what's more actually damaging? Because the important thing is what is actually causing harm? And to me, what's more damaging? A threat of violence is probably not even credible. Some idiot saying something disgusting about, you know, something sexist, racist, or homophobic, or things like lying about you and that lie gaining traction or somebody putting something up out of context that makes it look worse than it really is uh, or releasing your private information. I think that that, I mean, I would like to think that people's public inform private information could be out there and people don't use it to do terrible things, but Unfortunately, some people do, and everyone's situation is different. For some people, being doxxed is no big deal. For other people, it's terrifying because they work in certain jobs where protecting the privacy of your address, phone number, et cetera, et cetera, is important to you being able to go on and, and, and live with your life, live your life. I'm talking about people who are in like adult film or, you know, may work in the sex trade or something like that. And I'm sure there's other things as well. Uh, people fleeing a, a, an abusive domestic relationship where they have to sort of disappear to stop the person from following them. Things like this. Doxing can cause people like that real hardship. Um, so I think it's, it's very interesting and, and very important that they took the time to define what they considered harassment. Um, and it seems like we sort of understand that things like hate speech and doxing are bad. Um, there's other things that I think we have to have more of a dialogue on because I think it's important that people understand why, for instance, libel, 
it really messes a person up. I mean, I'm speaking about this personally. I've had a few things that no matter how many attempts I make to correct the record, people keep spreading false information and I am constantly challenged on, on certain things that just derail the conversation and don't allow me to do my job because people are so obsessed with this, these things that are either blown out of proportion or absolutely not true that I, it, it's, it's hindering my ability to earn a living at this point. And it's just exhausting to have this same thing, which is, let's face it, still sitting on the internet to torture me. The people who have, who are circulating this information, who have, who are keeping this information up without additional commentary, without, you know, additional context, even though I've gone out of my way to provide it, they're doing this deliberately. It's, it's a deliberate way to, um, screw me over. And the thing about that is they end up conscripting other people to go in and do their dirty work for them. Right. They have other people confront me saying, what did you mean by this? Or what happened with this? And I've said it again and again and again and again and again, but somebody saw it. And th this is the thing about Twitter. Twitter is powerful because you have direct access to, uh, certain individuals, but you know, it also means we'll be asking, we'll be answering the same question 500 times. And I wish that was an exaggeration. Um, you know, I've had a particular thing dogging me for almost a year now, and I've answered the same questions hundreds of times and it keeps coming back. And I don't really see anybody particularly interested in helping me correct the record. Meanwhile, there are plenty of people interested in, in spreading the misleading information. And there are plenty of people who have told me libel is not harassment. It's defamation. Well, that's splitting hairs, isn't it? That's semantics. I think that this is one of those things that we're bundling things together as harassment to force these companies to do something about it, not necessarily because it's a precisely accurate terminology. And I think that the groundwork that WEM is laying here is important. Now, I'm not saying that all of this stuff will be set in stone. What I'm saying is I want to commend them for taking the first step. Um, the other thing that I found very, very interesting is that um, th this is a chart about uh, the, the, what, what happened was that WAM set up their own form that people could fill out and then WAM would help them if, if they determined it, it was worthwhile, help them, you know, move forward and make sure the account is, uh, make sure things are reported properly. Because one of the things they discovered in this whole thing is that Twitter's tools are not easy to use. They're confusing. They're not user friendly. And so people were sometimes not having their harassment claim taken seriously because they didn't fill out the information properly. In other instances, Twitter does not accept things that could be better evidence than URL links. Um, they talked about this phenomenon called tweet and delete, where someone puts something up to harass a person and then deletes it before they can report, report the URL. I've had this happen a few times and I'm like, fine, screw off block done. You're, you're away from my life. I mean, yeah, they take out other accounts and they, they pick it up that way. But you know, it's, it, it is frustrating. And I, I'm, I, if you're looking at this here, you'll notice that in, in most cases, Twitter didn't do anything. And these were instances where women action in the media thought themselves that it was, it was credible enough to escalate. So, you know, in do look at the doxing numbers. When people's private information was released in two thirds of the time, Twitter did nothing. You know, half the time they did nothing. With, well, okay, two, uh, three to one, two to one ratio, two to three, two to three ratio. Uh, they did nothing with hate speech. The, the multiple accounts 
more often than not did nothing. Threats of violence, okay, they're they're more reactive. But interestingly enough, the threats of violence are the things that are probably the least you have to worry about. Even in revenge porn or non-consensual photography, Twitter didn't act half the time. This is, they're very small numbers, but this is cause for concern. I, I wouldn't condemn Twitter just based on these numbers because they are so small. But we certainly have to wonder why in something like doxing, why isn't that just a given that it's taken down? 13 people didn't have their personal information removed from Twitter. That's, that's disturbing. And like I said, the numbers are not large enough to be compelling from a statistical perspective. However, anecdotally, this, this is a sign that a bigger study could be warranted so that Twitter would actually be pressured to do something about this stuff. Now, the other thing I found very interesting um, was the fact that, you know, I, as I said, they, they said that Twitter's tools are about as clear as mud to use. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But um, when we, I'm just scrolling through all this stuff because this is all basically methodology. Um, the, the thing I did find interesting as well is the types of people that they found reported things and one group or a couple of groups that I found they included lend credence to this study. It, it gives me a, an indication that this study is actually objective, even though it's very small. Um, here they are, challenges face uh, people reporting harassment, uh, different types of people report harassment. We have the first time receiver, which, which we know. And, and what they found is the first time receiver is, is in a state of distress and Twitter's tools are confusing to use. And so they end up messing up the filing. And that obviously isn't good. The target of, of chaining, interesting terminology there. Um, they do in another port, part identify dogpiling as a form of harassment. So I guess this is, um, oh no, maybe it's further down, but, uh, there's the dog pile. They actually list dog piling as a form of harassment, which is also, um, a, a big deal because some people insist that dog piling is not harassment. I agree that it is, even if it isn't unintentional dog piling indicates that the, the information is being disseminated by a single source or a small series of a small group of sources. It is almost a, a, um, a deliberate viral injection into the internet that people disseminate this information so that, you know, people start yelling at a person. And I, I think, you know, maybe we have to start since, you know, dogpiling goes on far too often. Um, we sort of have to be a little bit more careful when I know I've, I've taken this into account now when I feel, um, like, Oh, I need to say something about this. I'll either say something privately, be very careful how I word it, but I also check a person's mentions to see if you know, 20 other people, have also said the same things. If 20 other people have said the same thing, I don't need to. And that does take self-control. Yes, it does. And, you know, angry mobs are not something the internet created. But the, the thing about the internet is that the angry mobs can get much bigger, much faster than, than they used to be able to. And it is overwhelming. I've been, I've been dogpiled multiple times. And the unfortunate thing is that I've actually found that when I get dogpiled over something, I dig in and I actually don't. It, it becomes an, an exceptionally ineffective form of protest because if, say, four or five people talk to me about something and I go, yeah, okay, you, you were right, I see your point. If 250 people dogpile me about something, I'm more likely to go, screw you, this is bullying. And, you know, I may even double down because it's just like, you will not, you know, 
You will not win through intimidation. You will not win through sheer noise. You won't get your way through bullying. So it's actually the people that think strength in numbers is, is giving them a stronger case. I think what we have to do is a bit of education here instead of condemning people for dogpiling because some people don't even know they're part of a dog pile. We have to make it clear that these targeted campaigns, these, these things that have spiraled off from these le organized letter writing campaigns that grip the summer and fall of last year, they're not, letter writing campaigns are one thing. If somebody takes the time to write a letter, fine. But when you're dealing with an individual instead of a company, four or five well-reasoned responses are much more powerful, I have found, than 200 people yelling at you. Um, then we've got, the, these are the other two, the harassed, the, un, the offended, but not harassed is interesting. They've, they've distinguished between those two, which lends the, the, the report credibility in my mind. Um, the, the delegate, another target of multi-platform harassment. These are all just the types of harassment. And then they actually had people trolled the, the wham reporting form unbelievable but believable at the exact same time but then we have the false flagger and the report troll and this gave the study a lot of credibility in my mind because this means that um they're not following you know the reductive form of listen and believe that has become so popular on the internet now they're actually looking to make sure these reports are credible before they escalate them and they actually did find that some people are pretending to be harassed some people are falsely reporting accounts for harassment um this is important the fact that the the um the report put this in it shows objectivity to me um and then let's get down to the the graphs this is actually important as well because twitter uh, historically doesn't tend to take bystander reports as seriously as direct reports from the person being harassed and and the numbers they got again I'm, I'm reluctant to really put too much strength. I won't be quoting these numbers because the sample size was too small, but it is interesting that this is what they found. Um, this is, this is the thing that really like, wow, most alleged harassers were unconnected with Gamergate. What they did was they took the GG auto blocker list, which full disclosure I am on and use that to determine who was a part of Gamergate. Now, that's a, that's a bad tool to begin with, right? People who followed certain people from Gamergate does not necessarily mean that they are part of Gamergate. But what this report found was, yes, that is in fact accurate. 88% of the people, well, so only 12% of the alleged harassers came from the GG autoblocker list, which again, it's, it's quite small, however, but however, it does add a little bit of credence to the idea that the GG autoblocker list is not an effective tool for reducing harassment. And if it's not an effective tool for reducing harassment, then what's it doing available to people on Twitter? We, we could assume that you know that it's not an anti-harassment tool at all which is what some people are saying it's it's a tool to bully in and of itself that oh you better not follow those people you better not be interested in what they're saying or you're gonna get put on a blacklist you know just just it's a brick in the wall right it's a brick in the wall we can't um you know we we can't say for sure it's a small amount but I, I crunched the numbers and I think it turned out of all the, the harassment complaints that were accepted and dealt with, only something like 22 came from people involved in Gamergate. And that, if Gamergate was really a hate movement, if it was, we would expect to see 
far higher numbers because of what a hate movement is and does, right? A hate movement isn't a group of people who sometimes says stupid things. A hate movement is a group devoted to hate, the extermination or the marginalization of a people based on an identifiable characteristic. In this case, people are trying to claim that Gamergate is a hate group against women. Well, it's kind of interesting that a women's group found that only 12% of the cases they saw and escalated were connected to Gamergate. I think that's pretty compelling, even though it's small, because of the media attention that linked the issue of online harassment so directly to Gamergate's main targets, Zoe Quinn, Brianna Wu, Anita Sarkeesian, etc. Um, so I, I think that's very interesting. Again, not the final story because the sample size is too small. However, interesting start. Um, I found their methodology as well uh, for evaluation interesting. Um, and, and I think this is actually something that, that could be, could be built on the, does the user demonstrate a pattern of targeting one or more other users with hate speech? Okay. Is this an imposter account? Has the user made threats of violence or threats to release private personal information or photos? Oh, wow. There's a lot of people that wouldn't be on Twitter if just threats were, were enough. Has the user used Twitter to share someone else's private personal information, whether contacting them? Oh, that's a doxing. Is the user using Twitter to spread verifiable lies about another person? There, there we are again. Is the user encouraging? Uh, like a verifiable lie, for instance, in my case, is people spreading, spreading screen caps were written by me. The screen caps are authentic. However, they are taken out of context. And they are taken out of context to make it seem like I am talking about the game The Witcher 3 and not the media presentation for The Witcher 3 at a press conference that I was actually talking about. So they're using information taken out of context, which is, they are my words, but they don't include the follow-up, the, sorry, the preamble to what I was saying where I actually made a comment about the press conference that I objected to. And so then a friend of mine jumped in and said, what game are you talking about? And so I said the name of the game that was being covered in the press conference. But people are taking this as proof. I was talking about the entire game, which I agree is not possible because it wasn't out yet. And this is one of these things that can I prove it? Well, yeah. And the problem now is that when this whole thing originally hit the fan months ago, we're talking back in September, um, people didn't react at the time, which I find very interesting. People had to go digging for this. And that's why I think that the, the, um, the, the way this is presented has made it worse because the context was removed. And it, removing this context has meant that instead of this just being an honest expression of my opinion, agree with it, disagree it, there's nothing wrong with me expressing my opinion, no matter how offensively you may find it stated. Um, this is different than me saying something I could not possibly be able to factually comment on, which is what I'm being criticized of. Now, this may seem like a very small thing. However, as a journalist, this is actually a very big deal at this point to be accused of. And that's why I'm so sick of it. And that's why I get so irritated because it's just people trying to cause trouble at this point. And I'd like people to realize that they're trying to cause trouble and not spread it. So is the user encouraging others to harass someone either online or off? Again, spreading this false information, why do it otherwise, to, other than to draw fire towards a person? Is the Twitter harassment just part of other harassment or other online platforms and offline life? I'm not sure what I, quite what this means. Is the Twitter harassment just part of other harassment or other online platforms? I think that could have been worded better that is this part of a greater campaign of harassment. That, that would make more sense. I think they're talking about the multi, 
multi-group. Like someone jumps from 8chan to Reddit to Twitter to Facebook and Tumblr or whatever. They just jump all around. Or YouTube. The number of people who, you know, continue... I have told them I, I don't want to communicate with them anymore and block them on Twitter. So they just jump to my YouTube channel and start le- leading trolly comments that, of course, other people jump in and, and argue with them and everything just goes to crap. Uh, and it, it creates a big scene, which draws more people. And it's just it, it's it's bad news. Is one person being overwhelmed by harassment sent by a group of users? This this is going to be the one that's the hardest one to solve because it is a legitimate, real phenomenon. I've experienced it myself. And the tricky part about this is that the individual people don't think they're doing anything wrong. Combined, the reality of the whole thing is exceptionally overwhelming. And this is, again, another education thing. It's not a question of of making people realize what they're doing is evil. They need to understand that what they're doing is overwhelming. And unless you're just looking to kick someone, it's not an effective way of getting change. And I think that's the important part of what education needs to be done regarding social networks. Is there anything else, really? Oh, this is just what they determined was worthwhile to escalate. Um, uh, Which is interesting, the number of threats of violence that were not escalated to Twitter, the number of doxes that were not escalated to Twitter. You know, they were very conservative in what they, in what they put forward, which again, I I give them credit for. Uh, I think um, people were afraid of what this report was going to do what this uh you know designated reporter status was going to do but i think that when getting involved is actually a very good thing because they they seem to be taking a very conservative approach to the reporting tools um and okay well this is different now twitter took action to suspend warn or delete in a reporter account in a majority of cases I, I don't know how they get majority here. I, I don't. 43% is not a majority. Well, I guess if you combined 43 and 11, so, okay, 43, 11, so that's still under 60%. So that's a majority, sure, but it's a very slim majority. I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable saying it's a majority here, but, but that's, that's where we'll diverge here. That's very interesting. Um, because this chart, this is the one I initially took note at. I don't consider this to look like a majority. A minority of doxes were removed. Uh, it, it doesn't say what, whether the tweets were removed, but you know, they take hate speech more seriously than doxing. And that's sort of a sticks and stones thing. Um, they don't take multiple, multiple harassments particularly seriously. Threats of violence. They seem to be doing better on. There's not really enough false information stuff to really get a, or impersonation to really get a baseline. They don't even take revenge porn or non-consensual photography. It's 50, 50. I look at this and I don't like what I see because these were already filtered results. These were already things escalated by a group that thought it was worthwhile to, um, bring forward. I would expect to see numbers closer to three quarters um, you know, or at least topping two thirds under 60%. There's a disconnect here between what Twitter thinks is harassment and what common sense dictates is harassment. And we're going to have to figure out, um, what, you know, what's being done. Okay. Here it indicates when something is deleted. Um, you know, they, they claim that fears for personal safety are taken seriously, but not, 
not by a resounding amount, right? And again, this is why I'm a bit concerned that the numbers are so small here that I, you know, I don't, I don't personally see a large difference um, between when risk of personal safety was argued and when risk of personal safety wasn't. Uh, there's still too, way, way, way too much gray in that risk of personal safety thing. I would think that if a verified reporting service said, in our opinion, there is a risk of personal safety, how do you think those 14 people feel who had their reports declined feel? That's, that's 14 people who were basically told by Twitter, we don't care that your safety has been determined to be at risk by a third party. That's grave grounds for concern for me. And I don't know why they rejected it. Twitter's reasons are absolutely opaque. But that, I don't know about that. I'm, I don't see this as, I mean, personal reports are one thing, but the fact that somebody authorized by Twitter to be, I assume, an objective third party, they make a recommendation and still, you know, more than two thirds, more than a third of the time, Twitter goes, nah. I wonder about that. Again, the study is quite small. So that's, uh, that's another thing with the, the, you know, um, and, and there's information about that. I'm not going to get into this because it would take two, you, as you can see, it's a long report. Um, and they, you know, they said as well that Twitter's got to take doxing more seriously. But I think what this study does overall, um, is show that there's still more work to do. We need more research and Twitter needs to start doing its own, um, internal investigation about whether they actually are serving their users appropriately. And th this, it, this is serious. This is a serious thing. Um, and, and I hope that, that people get behind this study for what it does instead of focusing exclusively on the fact that it's so small. But I would like to see this, and I'm gonna make a completely controversial statement here. I would like to see this as a beginning of the shift, a pivot in the dialogue regarding, you know, women in tech and, and harassment on the internet I'd like to see this as a beginning of a pivot away from an anti-Gamergate witch hunt to something more practical. It may not happen right away, but we have reason now to start questioning our assumptions regarding this issue. And I think that if we don't take a step back and go, huh, well, this is an interesting finding then we're just being driven by our own personal biases and ideologies and not the, the, the you know, small sample size, but interesting findings based on how closely in people's minds this was connected to an anti-Gamergate push. I would have expected to see far more Gamergate related um, reports than than what actually came through so there there is some good despite the small size of this sample um and there is some stuff to take from it and, and therefore i think that this study was worth doing uh now i will say again though that we we do need a more objective more um representative sample size um just so that we can make sure that these numbers are actually accurate numbers and not, um, not artificially pushed one way or another because of the poor media reporting and, you know, because of the, you know, relatively small amount that 
we're we're escalated to Twitter. We we need something around the you know thousand people thousand report mark to take anything seriously in in that regard. Um, so hopefully you guys found that useful. Hopefully you guys found my observations on it useful. Um, if you don't, I'm not sure why you're watching my channel to begin with, but um, hopefully this adds some clarity and, and a beginning of a um, questioning of assumptions so that we can all start getting along better and, and start building bridges instead of walls. Okay. Okay. Have a good day.